Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, but I'm Christina Hockner, a member of the Executive Committee of Flexible Learning Association uh, New Zealand. Sorry, I always want to say Aotearoa New Zealand. Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand. And would like to welcome you to our latest webinar, this time with Derek Renmoth and Dr. Michael Barber. Um, to get us started and also situated in today's session, let us uh, start with a karakia. Faya te maturanga kia marama, kia fai taki na mahi katoa, tu maya tu kaha, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato ia tato katoa. So it was my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's session that um, has been scheduled really, really briefly. So thank you so much for having um, seen all the announcements because um, Derek and Michael just very recently published uh, their report Tua Te Honunga Tangata, Tua Te Honunga Ao, Taking the Pulse of Distance Learning in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so it is fantastic to have them both here today. Um, Michael joins us from California, where he's the Director of Faculty Development and Professor of Instruction for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University, California. And Derek Renmoth is not too far away from most of you, um, living in the Wellington region, and he's the founder of Future Makers, which he established after stepping back from his position as Director of E-Learning at Core Education. And both of them, for those of you who have been involved in distance learning, distance education here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, are no new names. So let's welcome our friends and I'll hand it over to the two of them so that they can tell us a bit more about the report and whatever they'd like to share that might not even be in the report. Over to you two. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, and thanks for that introduction. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen here. Um, so yeah, so um, as uh, Christina mentioned, uh, I'm Michael Barrow. My colleague Derek Wenmuth is there at the top of the screen as well, or I guess depending on where you're situated, the side of the screen in my case. And um, uh, this is a report that we've been actually talking about and hoping to do for quite some time now um, and uh, this over the past I guess about six months or so we finally got the opportunity to act actively engage in it and um, so we're here just to tell you a little bit about it today so uh, to get started the first thing I want to say is that uh, the, we had a number of, of organizations that provided either uh, financial uh, sponsorship or financial backing to this particular project or in-kind sponsorship for it. Uh, my own university put up a, a, a nice grant that allowed me to come over and do a lot of this work. Uh, the Educational Partnership and Innovation Trust put forward some uh, funding, which is allowing us to extend some of the report, which we'll talk a little bit about at the end. Um, Derek and, and his organization, Future Makers, were able to, to you know, do a um, contributed in an in-kind fashion as well as Flans themselves uh, are the website hosts for the project uh, going forward and we intend to make this an annual project so that'll be an annual in-kind contribution that Flans is making for us and um, as someone who's done other reports similar to this I I'll be honest and say that um, you know without the um, contributions of these folks this type of report just doesn't happen. Um, so as uh, Christina just dropped in the chat there, the website for this is uh, flans.org.nz uh, forward slash dl dash pulse forward slash, or you can just do the easy thing and click on the link in the chat uh, and that'll get you there. Although don't go there until another 53 minutes from now because um, that'll you'll lose us. So the idea for this report, or the, the first, I guess, backing for this report, came about with some other work that Derek and I were doing well over a decade ago. Um, basically, the precursor to Flans was Dean's, and um, 12 years ago, I guess 13 years ago now, uh, I had a, a sabbatical at the time, 
and was over there and did one of the, the first national studies into virtual uh, the virtual learning network in New Zealand. And then a couple of years later, Derek and I, because in between those two reports, Derek actually did one for the what was the virtual learning network community at the time, offering three sort of ways in which they could become sustainable. So two years later, we did together a second report that sort of looked at all the different recommendations that had been made in those two reports and uh, other things that were being published at the time to try to come up with what should unfold in at least the, the virtual learning sector at the time. In both of those reports, one of the key recommendations was we actually needed to do a national study because while there were pieces that were getting known in terms of how much activity was happening in different sectors, there was no sort of global perspective in terms of what was happening within the school sector, broadly speaking. Um, you know, we had some good data from some of the virtual learning network clusters at the time, others not so much. Um, you know, the Takura, or at the time it was still the correspondence school, had a lot of information that was available. Um, there wasn't much coming out of the health schools at that point in time. Um, I have no idea how many, if any, of the privates that we looked at uh, were operating at the time. My guess is at least one or two of them, I believe, were operating back then, but I don't think it was more than that. Um, so we wanted to create this, this national study, and the idea behind the national study was to mimic the type of thing that we had seen going on in Canada, and this is the one that I've been responsible for in Canada for the last 16, we're in the 17th year now, and in the U.S., and as you can see in the U.S., they actually beat me to it by a couple of years. Um, but we had these other examples in North America that really took a good look at what was happening in terms of governance and activity all across the country. And that's really what we were looking for uh, in the, the, the New Zealand context. Um, one of the obviously differences between Canada and the US and, and New Zealand was over in North America, it was obviously done by jurisdiction, by province or state, uh, whereas there wasn't a need to do that in uh, New Zealand because it was just one single jurisdiction, um, which presented some of its own challenges. Um, now, knowing that, and I don't recognize all of the names in, in the audience, but I only recognize, I think, two or three as being in the, the school sector. Um, and uh, so for those of you that, that distance learning in the school sector might be a little bit new or a little bit unfamiliar, uh, one of the things that we do in the report, and I'm just noticing that I made a typo here. It's the nice thing about not doing it in presentation mode. I can fix things up as I'm going along. Um, one of the things that we do have in the report um, that takes up the first uh, probably 10 or 12 pages is a little look at the history of how distance learning has evolved over time in the school sector. And I won't spend a lot of time at this, but it, it, it's interesting to note that for those of you who are in um, the tertiary sector, the stages aren't all that different, but I think there's some interesting um, nuances along the way. So this idea of shift going from, you know, an initial start with um, more correspondence-based education to playing around with, with educational radio and instructional television, and then initially with computer-assisted instruction, and then really moving into the, the virtual learning environment with um, video conferencing, and, and which ends up turning into environments like this as the technology and the bandwidth gets better. Um, that, I think, is a common journey that those of you in the tertiary environment are probably familiar with, because many of your own institutions that have any experience with distance learning probably had a similar type uh, context, similar type of trajectory. Uh, one of the things that happened in the school sector that, that I think is a little bit different is what starts to happen after we get the development of virtual learning. Um, because what ends up starting is you get some support from the Ministry of Education for these individual clusters, as they were called at the time. Um, and there is a great deal of growth that starts to happen. And while that's happening, independent of that, we start to see this kind of growth that's happening in the urban environment, although that tends to be focused more on blended and, and hybrid learning, although they didn't call it hybrid learning at the time, um, then it does the more distance virtual learning that you see in, in, in the rural and remote environments. 
Um, while all of this is happening, uh, you have the correspondence school that is going through its own evolution to a more virtual environment, although because of the nature of the organization, they're moving more into an asynchronous online environment and moving into, you know, creating a lot of instructional materials and, and developing an asynchronous instructional model that can be delivered through a learning management system. Um, so there, there are all these sort of things happening in that 2000s and early 2010s teens type time frame. Um, something else that, well, I, I know my tertiary colleagues are, are familiar with, but uh, it was a little bit different for them, uh, were the, the cycles, we call it cycles of consultation. Uh, um, I would have called it a death spiral of consultation, to be honest with you, because you end up, there's a, a parliamentary inquiry on 21st century learning. There is a consulting company that uh, really has little history in this space at all that's contracted to, you know, come up with a plan for going forward. Uh, if you want to go back, that first report that I mentioned uh, that we did back in 2011 was also funded by the Ministry of Education. Um, you know, so there's a number of these the cycles that are happening again and again. And really, it's just going and covering the same ground. Um, you know, the one that, that was done by that consulting company I mentioned, even before they finished their process, the government was already announcing that it was going to be folded into the larger review of tomorrow's schools, which it was, but it got like two paragraphs in a 200-page a report. Um, so I'm not sure how much really it was folded in as opposed to just being an afterthought that was dropped in somewhere along the line because they said, oh, we forgot we were supposed to mention something about distance and virtual learning in here. Let me write up a couple of paragraphs and figure out where I could put it. Um, you know, and then many of you are, are likely familiar with the, the education amendment update that we went through, um, which introduced and approved cools. And then before the first one could even be uh, approved, uh, they were repealed um, when the new government came into to play. And then much like happened in the tertiary environment, you know, when COVID came around, we had that great pivot to remote learning, not distance or online learning, but remote learning. And, um, you know, we're now just starting to get back into a, a, a new normal as we come out of that. And so while there are some parallels, I think, with the, the tertiary sector, um, I think there are some unique aspects that were happening in, in, the, um, in the school sector that I, I think were important. Uh, along this. And, and for those of you that haven't had a chance to look at the report, if you are in the tertiary sector and this is a, an area you're interested in, I think those uh, ones, particularly as we get into this, starting with that section there. Um, so that middle part, I think, is probably the part that would be a little bit different than what you guys would have experienced in the tertiary environment. Um, so to the actual study. So what we were looking to do was for the 2023 school year, so the most recent school year that had been completed, uh, we were looking to essentially identify all of the providers of distance learning throughout the country, providers of distance learning at the school sector level um, throughout the country, and then find out essentially how they were governed or regulated or, or operated in terms of the structure that they worked under. Um, how they were resourced, because depending on the type of school that they are and, and, and what they did, they were resourced in many cases very differently. And then exactly what level of activity, what was the extent of the activity that was happening? How many students were we talking about? Um, and beyond just how many you know individual students, what does that look like in terms of a, a, a larger number, um, proportionally speaking? Um, so in order to undertake this, uh, we created a, a survey that we sent out to all of the providers of distance learning that we could find. And oftentimes we were finding new ones as we were actually in the midst of the, the, the research itself. Um, in many cases, we had to do follow-up interviews. Now, in some cases, those interviews were in person. Uh, in most cases, it was emails back and forth as we were trying to um, figure out exactly uh, what things meant because uh, one of the main challenges we did come up with is that there wasn't a common language that people had as we were going through and even ourselves 
Um, if you looked at our original survey that we sent out, I think we used three different terms in the same survey for the, the notion of a distance learning provider, uh, because there wasn't that sort of common language. Uh, and then we did a great deal of document analysis, um, particularly around certain types of schools. Uh, there was a lot of, of, of regulatory text that we could actually go through and use uh, to help us figure that out. As we developed profiles for each of the individual providers, we sent them back to the um, folks in charge of the programs, to the, of the uh, the schools or programs, to ensure that we got things accurate. Um, and there was a bit of back and forth with those, where our main concern was was around accuracy as opposed to whether or not. And there were some disagreements about how folks felt they were portrayed. But you know, we felt. Uh, Derek and I, as we went through it, focused upon, you know, did, were we misinterpreting things? Were we getting things wrong as opposed to were we presenting them in necessarily a positive or negative or, or neutral light? Um, so that's sort of how we put that together. Derek, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of process that I might have missed. No, I think you've you've captured what was going through my mind when I carry on. All right. Um, so getting into the meat of this, the, the first thing we had to do and, and um, this pulls into actually really the first, it really helps us with the crux of the first two research questions that we were looking at. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't have a common language uh, in terms of how to talk about uh, these different providers. Um, I used the term, even in the table, we were still struggling with this when we started the report, and we used the term entities in, in the report. Um, I think as we've started to flesh this out a little bit more and 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 as we're moving forward now i think providers is the term we're going to come into because entity seems like it's something that should be out of a marvel movie or something like that you know um but providers i think is, is a much better uh, way of looking at it um so we came up with two broad types um there were some that were defined from a legislative standpoint as schools and then there were others that simply just weren't defined by legislation and uh, we chose the term program for that, those particular ones. Uh, now, we chose program for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because most of the other terms we were thinking of were used either by the Ministry of Education or had specific legislative meaning that didn't include these types of distance learning providers. Um, so we thought about uh, well, we did think about things like entity. We thought about organizations. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other terms we we were banting about, Derek, off the top of our head. Yeah, no, the the main ones we talked about, but yes, there were several. Um. So and. and the first ones were kind of easy. The schools, because, you know, it's written right into the Education Act. It defines what they are and the different types of them. Um, so that was the easy one. The, the program was a little bit diff uh, more difficult. And then we then subdivided things between, um, we were initially talking about public and private for both of them. Um, but because programs weren't necessarily schools, and in theory, even the nonprofit ones were still private entities, even if they weren't working for the most part. And in many cases, they worked with both public and private schools, although the vast majority of the people they worked with were public schools um, or state schools, but they did work with both. So trying to come up with a, a little bit of a nomenclature around that. Um, so at least within the legislation, um, the public schools that we identified as either currently having or having historically had um, being providers of distance learning. Obviously, distance school, which is one of the legislative items, which right now, Takura is the only um, entity, the only provider that is indicated as a distance school in the legislation. Uh, there were also special institutions, and there were four of these, uh, the three health schools and, and, and the deaf school. Um, there are state schools that do provide distance education, um, so not that participate in one of the programs below, but ones that actually provide. And we did identify and highlight one of those. We're quite confident that there's a lot more of them um, going forward, but uh, it's up to you know us and for that matter them to help us self-identify who they are. Uh, historically, there have been some tertiary institutions that have provided school level learning. Uh, 
Um, we weren't able to identify any that were doing it during the 2023 school year. Um, but if you go back, especially in that history section, we even mentioned specifically some that, that had done that in the past. Um, and then there were private schools that were, were there as well. Um, if you've been following the news over the last couple of weeks, I'm guessing that when we do next year's annual report, there will be another category in the, the public one because uh, we've already had uh, media reports where two of those private schools have mused about coming, uh, about applying to become charter schools. Uh, I don't think either of them have actually put in applications for it yet. I'm not sure if the applications are actually available to do that yet, uh, to be honest with you. But there have been media reports that at least two of them have been thinking about doing that. So next year, there will likely be five up there in that, that public school category. Um, and then moving down to the programs, we divided them up. There were two main programs right now that operate in a nonprofit way with the vast majority of their uh, so the schools that they work with being uh, a state school, um, both of them, I think, have some private school in, involvement with them, um, but those private schools that are working with them work the same way that any public school would. Um, and then there was one uh, program that operated, operated entirely as a for-profit entity. Um, and um, so depending upon where you fell on this particular matrix, if you were or on this particular table, largely depended upon both how you were regulated and how you were resourced or how you were governed and how you were resourced. Um, so moving to the providers that we actually found, I should have put this slide a little bit later now that I'm thinking about it, but it's here now. So uh, this is it. Um, so the, the public distance learning schools that we had, uh, so those that fell either under the distance school or, in all honesty, the special educator or the special institution category, uh, those were Takura, the three health schools, and um, the the Deaf Education New Zealand program, um, the two nonprofit programs, uh, Kotuiaku and uh, Net NZ, uh, the one state school or public school that we knew of that were providing distance learning uh, were Rosemary. Uh, which basically they had three particular programs that they were providing. Um, and that lead was actually provided to us by uh, one of the leaders of one of the um, nonprofit programs uh, that were out there. Uh, for those of you who are in the room, if you are aware of other brick and mortar schools uh, that are actually providing distance learning opportunities, for students at their and other schools. We would love to know who they are because we'd love to start to include those in there. Um, as you can see on the, the right side of the screen, um, we had nine private school programs that we were able to identify. I should note that two of them didn't actually enroll any students during the, um, during the 2020, or sorry, the 2023 school, the 23, 2023 school year. Um, and uh, so basically the first one up there, 3H School International, and then the last one, Pinnacle Global, uh, didn't enroll any students during the, the, the most recent school year that's finished. And uh, But because this was our first report, we wanted to include them. As best we could tell, uh, 3H may have enrolled students during the 2022 school year and then have ceased to exist. As best we can tell, Pinnacle only got started in 2020. 2020-21, um, and they are still trying to enroll their initial students because they still seem to have a presence online. I don't know if they have students in this school year or not. I guess we'll find that out in about uh, 10 months or so when we start to do the next one. Um, and as I mentioned, two of them, the, the ones that uh, have been mentioned in the media are, are AGE school. I, I assume they do the initials because uh, they capitalize the AGE, so I assume it's not age school, I think it's AGE school, and uh, Crimson were the two that have been mentioned in media reports as potentially moving to that charter school uh, classification. And then, as I mentioned, there was one for-profit uh, program in Spectrum. So if you're looking at how these programs are governed, and again, it goes back to uh, you know, the chart that we were looking at here. So anything that's up in this school category has, um, there's language about it in the uh, Education Act. 
So as you're looking at the distance special and private schools, all of them specifically have language around them about how they operate. And in the case of the distance school, which would be Takura, it's extensive. Um, when you go to the actual report, the um, pro our profile around Takura is by far the longest. It's about three to four times longer than any of the others. And the main reason for that is simply because there is so much regulation that they have to follow between what's in the Education Act, what's published in the, the New Zealand Gazette, plus they have a, while all schools have to follow a collective agreement, either with the primary or the secondary uh, unions, Takura actually has a separate collective agreement with um, the, the PPTA around how they operate. Um, so there's additional provisions that go above and beyond what would be normal, what would be the normal expectation for a regular teacher for Takura. So because of that, that's, you know, if what we say about their programming and about their resourcing and about their numbers are about the same length as what we have for most of the others. But the uh, what we've got to say about their governance is just there's there's just so much there. And the more we dug into it, particularly as we started to get into the actual, you know, wording of how the legislation was put together, how different regulations were put together in the New Zealand Gazette, even just various provisions in the collective agreement that they've got um, with the, the teachers unions, it was quite, uh, quite extensive. Um, as you can see here, the Basically, the, the, the Education Act is all that governs privates. Um, special schools have both stuff in the legislation as well as in the Gazette that they have to follow. Um, and the two public uh, or the two nonprofit, actually, I should fix that, is why I don't post my slides till afterwards. Because um, I keep thinking of the nonprofit programs as being public programs, but um, to keep with what we've got in the um, in the uh, report, I'll call them nonprofit here. Uh, both of those are set up as charitable trusts. So they're governed by a trust document um, that uh, they have to follow. And then um, each of the trusts have boards uh, that oversee the the folks who are actually running the program. And, and in full disclosure, I, I'm, I'm on the board of one of those two uh, particular programs and, and have been uh, four programs there for quite some time. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything at this stage, Derek. And we're getting yeah, to pretty comprehensive, Michael. Carry on. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, so when it comes to resourcing as well, um, what you're <clears throat> finding is the resourcing for the most part for the schools are all largely dictated by either the Act or the Gazette, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so in the, the case of, of the, the, the private schools, they have the ability to apply for some public funding, but for the most part, their provisioning and their resourcing is done almost, ex I won't say almost exclusively, but the vast majority of it is through tuition dollars. Um, the special schools have uh, very specific guidelines around how they are funded. Uh, and for the most part, they get funded at roughly the same level or higher than what a regular state school would be. Um, and then Takura has, uh, again, this, this really convoluted process depending upon if you are a full-time student or dual enrolled student, or if you are an adult student, or if you are a, they, they've got three or four special categories in there, and each of them have different funding formulas uh, that, that apply to them. Um, generally speaking, you can look at them and say that they get about 50% of the FTE that a, a regular state school would get, for most of their students, but that doesn't apply to all of their students uh, because of the, the, the really detailed nature of the funding formula that they have. Um, in the case of the, the, the nonprofits, um, they historically have gotten um, some services uh, that were uh, provided by the Ministry of Education. In many cases throughout the years, they've had uh, contracts that uh, provide some of the provisioning, but most of their, their resourcing comes from their member schools. Uh, so their member schools basically uh, have, depending on the program, uh, 
Um, in some cases, it's an initial fee and then the provision of a teacher that gets you X number of enrollments, or if you aren't able to provide a teacher, you would provide the monetary equivalent for doing so. Um, and then while not on this page, the for-profit uh, programs, those are really the X factor in here because they are essentially a private business. Um, so there is nothing that regulates them beyond the fact that their students, for the most part, are have to be enrolled as homeschool students under the Education and Training Act. Uh, beyond that, they get no, uh, all of their resourcing comes from, uh, you know, private tuition dollars, and they're they have no regulatory environment. They have no larger governance structure in terms of a board or anything like that. It is basically the owner of the the for-profit program is is the law, if you will. Um, and there's not really another way to sort of describe that aspect of it. Um, in terms of the activity, this is the the stuff that really got us because the governance stuff, even without knowing what the common language was. If you wanted to go to an individual program and look up how they were governed, you could kind of figure that out because you knew where to look. Um, this is the, the type of information that really was largely new to us. And as you see, it's still not as refined as what we would like it. Um, so you can see here, supplemental would be those that are taking one or more courses online. So these are brick and mortar students that are enrolled in, in a course or two or more uh, from the distance learning provider. Um, if you're looking at the legislation, it would be the dual enrollment students uh, that are part of the, the Takura environment. Uh, Full-time are those folks that aren't part of a brick and mortar environment at all, although that is a little bit misleading in the case of the health schools. Um, so you can see how they're sort of broken down there. Um, the numbers for the health schools are, uh, like I say, the, it's a little bit misleading. That's why there's one asterisk there because um, we pulled out the numbers of students that we knew were also being served by Takura because we actually knew what those numbers are. But some of these students, so if I were to use, say, the uh, the Northern Health School as an example, of those 1,900 students that are there, some of them are actually in back in their brick and mortar classrooms for maybe a day or two a week and then still being served by the Northern Health School. Some of them are at home all of the time and a teacher from the Northern Health School actually physically comes to them and teaches them at a distance the rest of the time. In some cases, they will come to a center, one of the, I think it's 16 or 17 that the Northern Health School has throughout the Northern region. Um, so, the exact number of those that 1905 that are actually truly at a distance is something that not even the health school themselves would be able to give us an accounting of unless they sort of went through the enrollment one by one and figured out, okay, what is this student doing now? And because the goal for the health schools are to get those students to reintegrate back into their traditional brick and mortar face-to-face -face environments, um, that day, that number would change literally on a daily basis. Um, even the, the, the number itself, that includes the number of unique students that they had. So at no point during the last school year did the Northern Health School actually have 1,905 students at any given time. They might have had 800 in the first week and then 900 in the second week, but only 700 of them were in the first week. So they had 200 new students. So really now there's a thousand different students that they've worked with because a hundred of them have gone back to their, um, you know, so that kind of changing environment really uh, makes that difficult for them to, um, to, to come up with. Um, when we look at the um, numbers that we're getting from uh, Deaf Education, Kotoyako, and um, uh, to a lesser extent, Net and Z, there are some of those students that are also enrolled in courses in um, Takura. So if I'm taking a course from Takura and I'm also taking, say, a course from Net and Z, I'm showing up uh, twice on that list, but I'm only one unique student. Um, so when I look at that total of 13,691 at the bottom, I could be counted in there twice. In fact, if I was taking a course from uh, 
um, one of the privates, for example, and um, net NZ and Takura, I could show up in there three times. If I happen to have gone to a health school for a month during the school year, I could be in this chart four times. Um, you know, so the number of unique students that we have, and that's one of the reasons why we have the, the tilde uh, there at the bottom, because we aren't really sure exactly what the exact number is. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why we provide that range uh, for the full time, uh, because there's a lot of, of leeway that you see in there. Uh, the other problem that we had is with the, the private programs, um, because so many of them did not uh, participate in our data collection uh, that we had, while we were able to get the number of students that were enrolled in those particular schools, most of those schools, at least all the ones with the three asterisks by them, uh, they had a in-person uh, option and a distance option. So of say, for example, the 92 students at AGE school, 91 of them might have been in the in-person school and only one of them might have been taken out at a distance. For that matter, 91 of them could have been taken out at a distance and they might have had a, a physical school of only one, although that's kind of unlikely because why would you have a full school for one student? But you, you, you get what I mean. So those numbers could be the bottom end of that, that number that's there or it could be the top end. And until we can get their participation in this study, um, it'll be difficult for us to really get a sense as to the exact number that we have here. Um, now, if you break it down sort of, you know, by some of the categories that we have here, uh, you start to get some, some interesting figures. Uh, so here on this table, you can see we've got the total number of students um, that are in each of those particular environments. So the total number of primary students across the country, uh, the total number of secondary students, the total number that are in composite schools, special schools, home-based education, and so on. And then you can see, at least based upon our figures from table from the previous table, what we think are the number of distance learning students in each of those different environments. Um, and you can get a sense as what proportion that is across the country. Um, so as an example, um, and obviously the special institution or special school category is skewed because it's all the health school students, but about two thirds of the health school, you know, about two thirds of special students um, take some form of education at a distance. Um, less than 1% of primary school students um, across the country are enrolled in one or more distance learning opportunities. Um, approaching 10% of secondary students um, again, you know, with all the caveats that we were talking about earlier in terms of the, you know, the inability to count some of these numbers. But when you look at it this way, you know, it, it really um, gives you a sense as to um, how some of this is, is a little bit different. And even when you look at the home-based education uh, one, we've got, you know, 0.1 in there as our number, um, but we really aren't sure about that. Um, you know, the New Zealand Homeschool uh, Association, I can't remember the exact name of it now um, off the top of my head. But when I reached out to them and asked them about the different, you know, services, they don't provide, they broker. And when you read hmm. through on their website, the different services that they broker, many of them do seem like the self-paced distance learning type things that a lot of the private schools are providing. So my guess is, is that a lot more of those 10,777 home-based education students are probably engaged in some form of distance learning through one of these, these brokers that are provided by um, one or more of the homeschool associations that are in throughout the, the, the country. Um, so when we're looking at the activity, there's you know a couple of, I guess, broad takeaways that you want to make. Um, when you calculate it all up, it works out to about 4% of all students in the school sector uh, had enrolled in, and I call it courses, really it's distance learning opportunities, um, because depending upon the level that they're doing, and um, when you look at the things being offered at the uh, by the special institutions like the health school and, and deaf education. In many cases, they're not courses that they're offering, it's programming that they're providing. Um, uh, so um, 
but about 4%. So roughly one out of almost one out of every 20 students in the country last year took at least some kind of distance learning opportunity. Um, that varies significantly depending on the type of school and the, the level of the, the student. Um, and, you know, when you look at sort of the range, I think it's, we can safely or comfortably estimate that about 1% of the primary population is engaged in this. We're getting close to 10% of the secondary population that's engaged in this type of learning. Um, my guess is while we don't have the data, uh, if we were looking at historic data or as we continue to collect this over time, uh, we'll have seen that if we look back in time that both of those numbers have grown significantly. Um, and I think that if we, as we move forward, we'll see both see them continue to grow. As an aside, I can tell you that in Canada, uh, it's about 6% of all stu K-12 students or all students in the school sector that are engaged in, in, in some form of distance learning. Um, and in the U.S., it's estimated between 5 and 8%. Uh, so New Zealand as a country is basically roughly in the same ballpark as those two other jurisdictions that we actually have national data for. Um, but that's sort of a, a kind of where we're sitting right now in terms of of the activity. Uh, the other thing that I should have mentioned back in the methodology uh, slide that I, I'll mention now, um, obviously this is traditional distance learning opportunities. So these are planned distance learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's not the remote learning type environments, uh, the hybrid learning type environments that we've seen put in as temporary measures uh, due to you know COVID. Uh, or other natural disasters that it seems to always inflict you guys just about every school year uh, lately. Um, you know, these are ones where the, uh, I like to call them traditional distance learning ones, ones that were planned and thought out and uh, intended for this delivery, regardless of circumstance, as opposed to those that were just put in place because of circumstance. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything about the the activity, Derek. No, I'm just pleased you raised the the bit about hybrid because that was a big part of our discussion, and to deliberately exclude them was was an important part of making sure our focus was just on, you know, the traditional conventional distance ed providers, um, and like in uh, Michael's saying, we would expect or we'd anticipate a rise in these numbers given the current level of kind of interest in the way things are working. So this is this is providing an excellent um, benchmark, I think. Um, the only other thing that we, and we really hadn't intended to collect much data on this, but as we started looking at the nature of programming, because uh, you notice it's, we didn't have a research question around instructional models. Uh, but really, there were three dominant models that emerged as we started looking at how folks provided programming. Um, there was the asynchronous model, and this is the model that Takura uses, where they have a teacher that's responsible for creating online course content, and that's housed in a learning management system. And then they use all of the tools of the learning management system to actually deliver that course. So it's not... A, a correspondence model just gone online, uh, which in all honesty, when you look at the history of Takura, as they started to move to online initially, that is really what it was. Um, in the, the past, I'm, I'm going to peg it at about eight years or so. Derek, you might be able to, to give me a firmer number on that. But in the past eight years, I think they've really done a good job of moving beyond an online version of correspondence education to truly providing asynchronous online learning. Um, and, you know, it wasn't like a switch that just eight years ago got turned on. This has been something that they've been developing over time. Um, most of the other programs, so when we look at the, the special institutions, when we look at the nonprofit programs that are out there, um, even the state schools or the public schools that are providing distance learning, um, the majority of instruction that they provide is a synchronous model uh, of, of uh, instruction. And then when it comes to the privates, most of them tend to be using a, a self-paced independent learning model. Um, that's sort of a nice way of saying that it looks a lot like a correspondence model, except for instead of focusing around courses, 
it focuses around the individual student. Um, so in most of these environments, the first thing that happens is the teacher that is assigned to the student would meet with them and come up with an individualized or personalized learning plan. And then from that point on, it looks very much like what our traditional correspondence education would have looked like. Um, and that's how, I won't say all, because uh, Crimson and One School Global in particular, uh, as well as Mount Hobson, um, really are different than that. But the other six that are there, uh, they really utilize this independent learning model. And in many cases, um, not even with instruction or with you know the printed packets or the asynchronous content that they create themselves. In many cases, it's stuff that's leased. Um, uh, actually, several of them use uh, a, pro a Christian-based program out of the U.S. that uh, has a lot of controversy associated with it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so that's not something we necessarily intended to to look at something as we move forward we will probably spend more time diving into and hopefully trying to be able to provide some good examples of this kind of environment um, because as an example those that are using primarily the synchronous model some of the lessons that were being learned from how to create effective ways in the asynchronous one could come in handy ways in which the programs that are primarily using the asynchronous model could be incorporating more synchronous into their environment and finding good examples that we can leverage to show that, I think would just improve the delivery of, of distance learning uh, for all of these schools and programs, to be honest with you. Um, so as we're getting with about 10 minutes left or so, um, I just wanted, because I anticipated I would do most of the talking as I've been going through here. And so I wanted to give, um, uh, well, Derek, and then I can play off him if, if, if something comes to mind. You know, we've, we've done this study now and we've got a couple of others that are either close to being finished or that we're just starting. Um, you know, so we've had a chance to do a real sort of systematic dive into this in a very relatively short period of time. Um, so I, I, I want to give Derek a chance to sort of, as he, we've looked at this over the past couple of months, if there are things that I haven't had a chance to touch on that you really wanted to underscore before we sort of open this up to questions. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I, look, I, I think in the interest of time, particularly, there's not a lot to add to what you said, because I think you've given a very good overview. The only thing I did want to just draw attention was on that previous slide, I think there's a lot there that will resonate for the people on this particular um, webinar because the interests that we've long held in the tertiary sector around the, the choice or the, the structure of the module, the, the link between asynchronous, synchronous, the things that Michael has outlined, um, is, is where there's a real curiosity as more and more online or distance education occurs. And it's a, it's a personal perspective, but it came out through some of our interviews and studies to find out the extent to which, you know, uh, uh, the choice of model is often predicated simply on a personal hunch or a particular disposition of the, the group organization or even individual, rather than necessarily being linked strongly to anything that we would say is grounded in research. Um, and as Michael was starting to to talk about, you know, we're getting a lot of nuanced decision making now also between, you know, a, a one size fits all model that may be characteristic of a particular organization without drilling down and saying, well, actually, sometimes the uh, the modality will vary depending on the um, the particular subject or or focus for instruction for example or the nature of the the group or individuals taking place so i think this is an exciting area for future um research not just within the project we've done but within uh distance ed more broadly so before we open it up to questions just want to let you know that um we had a secondary study that we were doing in this where we were interviewing uh, stakeholders from across the country involved in the, the school sector, uh, some directly involved, some indirectly involved, many government agency and other support organizations, uh, asking them about sort of what their vision of a, a future ecosystem for schools in New Zealand was. Uh, so we're, uh, Derek will be presenting that at the FLANS conference uh, next month. And uh, we hope to have a paper 
that we can submit to uh, the Journal of Open, Flexible, and Distance Learning shortly thereafter, probably in the conference edition, fingers crossed. Um, and right now we uh, actually, I made the mistake of sending it out during school holiday, so I'm going to have to start sending reminders now next week that people are actually back from school holiday. Uh, but we did send out a, a we, and this is uh, largely uh, we were able to do because of the funding we got from the Educational Partnership and Innovation Trust. Um, we were able to um, ask the providers that we've uh, identified uh, for data that they had from 2019 through 22 so that we would have, including the one study we've just done, we'd have five full years of data, a pre-pandemic year, three sort of pandemic influenced years, and then ideally I would like to think that 23 was sort of our first post-pandemic year, and uh, that'll really give us a good sense as to be able to figure out some of that. So again, the website is there and we've got about seven minutes for questions. But also Derek for um, presenting your report and some of the findings. Um, Michael, do you maybe want to jump out of the screen share so that it's easier to, to see everybody? So yes, do we have any questions? Yeah, I do. I was giving everybody else a chance to ask first. <laughs> it's just occurred to me as um, you're presenting, and I spent some time going through the report yesterday, as you're probably aware, Michael, because I was firing you some questions. But um, I've just thought too that in the um, model for the VLN that schools actually provide programs and I wonder did you discuss whether schools should also be appearing there as being contributors and participators in their own right? Uh, yes we did have that conversation actually I think we even have some language about that in the nomenclature section of the report um, because in programs in general, and this is not just a, a New Zealand situation, this is what happens in, in North America, it's what happens in, in Australia as well, and at least in two programs I'm aware of in, in England. Um, they have that co-op model that, that you guys are familiar with, where you either through membership or through contribution become a, a, a member of the cooperative. And you basically contribute to the cooperative in the form of providing a teacher who is actually the one who's providing the distance learning. Um, and you then receive an equal amount. And if you want more, you contribute more. Um, and But the reality is, is that wouldn't happen without some kind of broker. Right? Mm. So if the, the VLN clusters didn't exist, it might happen in, in one or two schools might partner with each other to do that kind of thing. And, and we saw that actually as a good example, the Illinois Virtual High School, that's one of the ways, one of the ways in which it was formed. Um, I was in Canada working at a school that was providing distance learning to five or six schools in my district. But even within those five or six schools, none of my classes had more than single digit enrollments. Mm. Uh, I had a colleague that I had met at, uh, you know, an, an AP reading a couple of years earlier and reached out to him because I knew he taught at least three of the courses we were offering and asked him if he took would take his in-person class and partner with my distance students so that I'd have enough people to have discussions and stuff like that in the learning management system. Essentially, I was providing distance learning to him and he was providing distance learning to me. Um, but it wouldn't have gone beyond our two schools had there not been some sort of broker uh, that was there. So it was that brokerage aspect that made it become a program. Um, so that's why we, we decided to do that, um, because <laughs> the other thing that you run into with that is if you have, uh, I'm just going to make up some numbers here now, but if you have a VLN cluster that has six schools that can't provide a teacher, so they provide the money, so that cluster then provides the teacher, they're a provider, but then if they also have 20 other schools that are able to provide a teacher, now you've got 20 providers, well, 21 if you count the program there. None of them would exist without the cluster in, in the first place in terms of the, the distance learning provider. Um, so that's why we, we 
chose not to do that. And if you look at the way in which we presented uh, Rosami in, in, uh, in the report, we focused upon the programs that were outside of the scope of their involvement with any of the VLN clusters. But no, we debated that a fair amount because we were trying to figure out, because we figured there's going to be a lot more like the, the Rosamese, uh, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong because I don't know where the, the, the dash should be in terms of the... the Rosamini. Yeah, yeah, I just sort of um, think... We figured there's a lot more like that out there, to be honest with you. Yeah, Many That's of which are likely the, participating in one of the clusters. Yeah, from the, from the health of... of um, things that, you know, taking the pulse, I guess, from, from their perspective is around, you know, um, who's engaged, it's just a different level from looking at students, from looking at, at schools, because schools sort of go 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 through the system, system, if that makes sense. You know, the participation of schools is something that we've always reported on, and, it's, and I've just noticed, well, it's an element that's missing out of this report. Yeah, I think at some point we say the total number of schools that were in there. And if we didn't, um, it's only because we weren't able to get that data from everybody because uh, we wanted to be consistent in what we were providing. And, you know, the other thing it brings up, if you look at like the health schools, as an example, or, you know, the, well, the deaf education, any of the three special institutions or four special institutions, in many cases, they are working in partnership with those special institutions. Um, you know, do we count all of those folks as being providers? Because they are providing some distance learning aspects uh, when you look at it. Um, so it, it it was a decision as to where you draw the line. And, and we looked at the line in terms of those that were brokering services, which is also why we use the, the broad term of provider. Mike, if I could interject there. Rachel's question. And looking at the time, um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today for the questions. However, um, Michael, you had already alluded to the fact that people can catch up with Derek at the Flans conference that we're having in just a few weeks. I did also put the link into the chat. So please do come along to not just listen to Derek, but many others who are presenting their research and their ideas and um, projects at next month's uh, conference in Tamaki Makaro, Auckland. Um, if you are not yet a member of um, Flexible Learning Association New Zealand, we'd definitely also like to invite you to join us um, so that we can provide more of these webinars. And I'm sure that Derek and Michael will have a few more webinars um, lined up in the coming weeks to talk about the report and if you catch any of them you do have more opportunities to ask them any questions so thank you everybody actually for we we have one with next coming up next month uh, nex mm -hmm. and and that is going to be more focused on on, on because it's more of a k-12 audience uh, we'll probably spend a lot more time talking about and trying to dissect what we learned about those three instructional models, because I think that'll be something that would be of more a greater interest to to that audience, uh, probably less on the the policy and and the resourcing aspect, because other than the individual leaders, um, the teachers probably aren't interested as much in that. And then in early September, we have one with the Educational Partnership and Innovation Trust. Uh, which will probably focus a little bit on both this study as well as that future looking study uh, that we were talking about. So uh, if you go to all three, you'll get a slightly different perspective on the uh, research, uh, depending upon the audience. Perfect. And um, Michael and Derek, if you can send me all the links to those events that you've just mentioned for the registration pages, I'm happy to include them into the follow up for this webinar um, when I'm going to send out the link to this recording. And that'll happen once I've corrected the transcript. And then you have easy access to all those links. So thanks, everybody. And now just our karakia before we are all heading off to do some other things. Kia whakaere te tapo. Kia vatia ai te ara. Kia turuki whakataha ai. Kia turuki whakataha ai. Omie uie ai pie. Kia ora. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Thank you.